In November of 2018, Brethren Voices featured an interview with Mark Charles, a native Navajo who currently lives in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. We had met with Mark at the 2018 Church of the Brethren Annual Conference held in Cincinnati, Ohio. At one of the insight sessions, he shared the complexities of American history regarding race, culture, and faith. Mark advocated a path of healing and reconciliation for the nation that had never been done and was way overdue. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. We're coming to you from a private garden in Vancouver, Washington, because our TV studios have been closed for the last six months because of the pandemic. A lot has happened since that first meeting with Mark Charles in July of 2018 at the Brethren Annual Conference. Mark has continued to be an activist, a public speaker, consultant, and he co-authored a book, Unsettling Truths, dealing with Native American issues and the doctrine of discovery, which most of us have never heard about, but which affects us all. And on May 30th, 2019, Mark Charles announced that he was running for the presidency of the United States as an independent. There are actually hundreds of candidates running for the office of the President of the United States this year, but very few will be on the ballots in every state. Brethren Voices will not be endorsing any presidential candidates. However, Mark Charles' message is one that needs to be heard. We met up with Mark prior to the pandemic earlier this year at one of his campaign appearances. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. You may have heard me say this before, but it's important we do this every time that we gather in case there's someone who doesn't know me yet. But um, we always give our four clans and we're matrilineal as a people with our identities coming from our mother's mother. So because my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, um, I say Tsinbeke Dene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sin Kedna. And my fourth clan, my father's father is Totochitni, which is the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I want to also acknowledge that tonight we are on the land of the Chinook, the Kalapowitz, Kalapuya, I'm sorry, and the Clackamas. And I want to acknowledge that these are the nations that inhabited these lands. They hunted here, they fished here, they farmed here, they raised their families here, they buried their dead here. These were the nations that had their nations here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And it's important that we acknowledge the people whose land we're on no matter where we go. I like to acknowledge the people no matter where I go around Turtle Island to remind myself these lands weren't discovered and to remind myself that there's a story to these lands we have to always keep in the, for in the forefront of our minds. I want to talk to you a little bit about my campaign, but I also want to talk to you about some of the things I think I bring to this campaign because one of the questions that is raised a lot is, well, how do you expect to be president if you've never actually served in public office before? Um, and there's many people who are kind of worried about the, the experience or the lack of experience I might bring into this job and into this conversation I'm trying to do. And so I want to share with you a bit of my story. If you had asked me when I was a young man, even when I was in college, about the relationship between natives and non-natives, about the relationship of people of color and the situation of people of color in this country, I probably would have told you that our history was bad, but today we're doing much better. I was fairly naive, and I, I, I felt like, yeah, things are going pretty well right now. And when I was about 25 or 30, I think about 30, I was asked to pastor a church in Denver, Colorado, called the Christian Indian Center. And while I was there, the, the, the group I was with, the congregation I was, I was pastoring, um, they were wrestling with what did it mean to be Native and be Christian. 
And one of the reasons they were wrestling with that issue was because of the damage from the boarding schools that had told our people that we need to kill the Indian in you to save the man and we need to forcibly assimilate you to Western European culture. And that was one of the first times I really began to engage deeply with the, the historical trauma of our people that had come from boarding schools. And after pastoring that church for two years, I realized if I was going to be in the heart of this dialogue, because I was raised in a border town to the reservation, because I had not grown up speaking my language or practicing my culture, if I was really going to be a part of this dialogue, I had to gain some more experience and integrity. And so I moved with my family from Denver, Colorado, back to the Navajo Nation. For three years, we lived in a very remote section of our reservation. We were six miles off the nearest paved road on a dirt road. We lived in a one-room hogan, about 20 feet in diameter, dirt floor, log walls. The community we lived in had no running water, no electricity. We had an outhouse about 50 yards outside of our hogan. Our neighbors were rug weavers and shepherds. We moved there prepared to live off the grid. We moved there to haul our water, to live by candlelight, and to cook over a camp stove or even an open fire. We prepared to kind of live under this hardship of living off the grid, but what completely caught us by surprise, what took our breath away, what shocked me was how marginalized we felt while living there. I literally felt like we dropped off the face of the earth. I quickly learned that primarily the only group of non-natives who ever come to Indian reservations are those who come to take our picture or those who come to give us charity. While I was there, I also began learning about what's called the doctrine of discovery. There's a lot of native leaders who have done a lot of work on the doctrine of discovery. Stephen Newcomb comes to mind who wrote an excellent book called Pagans in the Promised Land to wrestle with this doctrine. Essentially the doctrine of discovery, it's a series of papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493. It's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and their land is yours to take. While living on our reservation and experiencing and seeing the, the historical trauma of our, our native peoples from boarding schools, while living in this marginalized community with no running water, no electricity, and the only white people we ever saw were those who came to take our picture and give us charity. While studying more of our history and learning about this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery, I began in those moments to feel very, very, very angry. And I was trying to figure out what was going on inside of me, and I would talk with my friends, my non-native friends living off the reservation, over the phone or over email, because again, they weren't coming to the reservation. And every time we had a dialogue, I could feel this emotion rising up in me and soon I would want to hang up the phone or I would start yelling at my friends. And so, so I learned how to temper myself. I learned how to talk about this history in a, in a way like I read it in the newspaper. And I found if I did that I could stay in the dialogue longer, but soon my friends would get defensive. We didn't do that to your people. My family didn't do those things and soon they would hang up the phone because they were so upset with me. And I could not figure out how to have this conversation. I couldn't figure out how to articulate what I was feeling and keep my non-native friends engaged in the conversation. And one day I was writing a letter, it was like the tenth time to try to get them to understand how I felt. And in my letter I said, being Native American and living on a reservation in the middle of our country, it feels like our Native communities are this old grandmother who has a very large and very beautiful house. And years ago some people came into our house and they violently locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food, they're having a party inside our house. They've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but now it's much later and we're tired, we're old, we're weak, or we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, that causes us the most pain, is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. 
I said that, and I'm like, that's it. That's exactly how I'm feeling. I started sharing that with some of my neighbors and people who lived around me, and they would say to me, I've lived here all my life. I always struggle to articulate how it feels, and you're hitting the nail on the head. I would share that with non-natives. And instead of getting defensive, they would come back and say, how do I say thank you? How does my family, my community, my city, my state, my country express gratitude to the host people of Turtle Island? See, now we're having a very different conversation. Now instead of talking about victim versus oppressor, now we're talking about what I think is the heart of the problem we face as a nation, which is we have this reversal of roles. We have 300 million undocumented immigrants living here, acting like they own the place. We have 6 million indigenous peoples being treated like hosts, like unwanted guests in someone else's house. And on top of that, we have a, a large African-American community who neither immigrated here, nor are they indigenous here, but they were, they were brought here and enslaved. We have these very murky roles. We have these undocumented immigrants, most of them from Europe, acting like they own the place. How do we begin to change this? How do we begin to realign this? How do we begin to have this type of conversation? And I realize it's not having the conversation of victim versus oppressor only sends people fleeing. Having the conversation about this reversal of roles actually begins to bring about the dialogue we need to have. And this metaphor I've used of the grandmother in the house, I've used this not only in the US, but in colonized nations with colonized people all around the world to begin to engage a conversation between colonizers and the people they colonized. And I think this is some of the work we have to do as a nation because there is, there is a history that our country has no clue, nor does it have any desire to talk about. And it doesn't know what to do with that history. And I have literally, since we moved to the reservation from Denver back in 2002, I have spent the last 18 years of my life not just studying the history, not just examining the documents, not just seeing the impact they have today, but trying to figure out how do I get my nation to begin to talk about these things? How do I begin to engage this dialogue so that we can actually get to a better place? In his final State of the Union, President Obama was talking about the need in our nation to have a new politics. He had felt this incredible divisiveness by our country against his presidency the entire eight years he was in office. And he was almost lamenting this in his last State of the Union. And he was talking about the need to have a new politics. And he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people. Our Constitution begins with these three simple words. words he said, we've come to recognize, now mean all the people. I heard him say this, and it sounded beautiful, and I wanted to believe him, but I've studied too much of our history, I've lived in too many of our reservations, I've seen too much of this past, and I had to stop and ask and say, when, Mr. President, when did we decide this? The Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. The Constitution never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. The Founding Fathers absolutely did not believe we the people meant all the people. Abraham Lincoln, two and a half years after signing the Pacific Railway Act in 1862, after the hanging of the Dakota 38 in Minnesota, the massacre at Sand Creek in Colorado, and the long walk for the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache in the territory of New Mexico has literally ethnically cleansed the states of Minnesota, Colorado, and New Mexico to make way for the Transcontinental Railway. 
making him one of the most white supremacists and genocidal presidents in the history of our nation. Abraham Lincoln absolutely did not believe we the people meant all the people. I remember learning about this nation's constitution in school, especially what I thought we the people meant. Most of us probably had studies in U.S. history in the eighth grade and in high school. But we, did we learn it all? Of course not. And African and Native American history was just a few pages at most. Mark Charles takes us down a path of new understanding as he discusses the opening lines of the Constitution. We, the people. Just a few months ago, the state of Virginia ratified the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, the amendment giving women the same rights as men under the Constitution. Why do we need this amendment? Well, if you read the Constitution from preamble through the 27th Amendment, you will find that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns. 51 he, him, and his who can run for office, who can hold office, even who's protected by this Constitution. There's not a single female pronoun in the entire Constitution. The Constitution was not written to give women equal rights. And you know why Virginia finally passed it in 2020? Because they got a majority of women in their legislator. That's what it took to pass it. But then when they had passed it, they had gone over the date of when it could be passed. And so now there's this debate going on that it may not even count. And we may have to go back and do the whole process all over again. Think about it. It's 2020 and our nation can't even frickin' decide that we want to treat women the same as men. Two weeks ago, the Congress made lynching illegal. Think about that. Why did they have to make that? Why? Because according to the Constitution, Black people are not human. They're three-fifths, so the law against murder doesn't apply. This is why we need a separate law saying that if a white person lynches a black person, that's illegal because the law for murder throughout our history never held that as true. In 1825, we had a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one got the same land from the government, and they want to know who owned it. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The court had to decide the principle that land titles were based on. They ruled that the principle was that discovery gave title to the land. And then they referenced the doctrine of discovery and used that to conclude that even though natives were here first, but because we are savages, we only have the right of occupancy to the land, while Europeans have the right of discovery to the land, therefore they have the fee title to the land, so they are the true title holders. That case, along with a few others between 1823 and 1830, create the legal precedent for land titles. That precedent and the doctrine of discovery are referenced by name by the Supreme Court in 1820, in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. In 2005, there was a Supreme Court case stating that the Oneida Indian Nation could not reclaim sovereignty over their traditional land, which they bought on the open market and paid full price for. And the first footnote of the case referenced the doctrine of discovery. I have a TEDx talk online 
titled We the People, The Three Most Misunderstood Words in American History, laying out the details of that case, identifying it as one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinion in my lifetime. And you know who wrote it? 2005. That opinion was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Why? Because when your land titles are based on a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery, white supremacy is a bipartisan value. In our nation, we the people has never, ever meant all the people. Last Tuesday, the Democrats decided after they had, our nation had elected a black man to be president in 2008. And he served for eight years. And then the Republicans responded by nominating and electing an incredibly explicitly white supremacist, racist, and sexist president like Donald Trump. And after three and a half years of Donald Trump, on Super Tuesday, after having one of the most diverse pool of candidates in the nation's history, more women, more people of color, members of LGBTQ, after having more than 20 people The first debate last June had 20 people, women, people of color, on the stage. And last Tuesday, the Democrats decided, in their wisdom, that they were going to run one of two 70-year-old white landowning men from the 1%. They cleared everyone off the stage. No, no women, no people of color, no members of LGBTQ. We think the best solution to President Trump is another 70-year-old white landowning male from the 1%. Are we willing to have these endless debates about moving the ball forward a couple feet about taking a few steps forward, maybe towards a little bit more equality, instead of having the conversation that, you know what, we should probably abolish slavery. We should probably agree that women have the same rights as men under the law. We should probably remove this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery from the legal precedent of land titles. Bernie Sanders likes to say that the changes he's advocating for aren't that radical. Well, neither are mine, Senator Sanders. I'm tired of having these debates about who is human and who is not human. So I'm calling the question. I'm calling the question. Do you want to live in a nation where we the people actually means all the people? When you go to vote this November, you may see many individuals running for president of the United States. But few will recognize the name of Mark Charles one of the few Native Americans to ever run for the office of the President of the United States. He will run a campaign for probably less than $100,000. And the major candidates, they will probably spend about a billion dollars each. Again, these aren't radical changes. This isn't earth shattering. This is just saying, I want to live in a nation where we can agree that we're going to treat everybody as human. 
I'm wearing my hair, my siyeth, my Navajo bun, tied with red yarn. I'm wearing it tied with red yarn to remind myself and those I'm around of the crisis in Indian country known as missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. We have hundreds, thousands of indigenous women and girls who have been reported as missing and even as murdered and not only have their cases not been closed but oftentimes they haven't even been opened. There's been no follow-up by agencies, federal agencies, no follow-up by law enforcement. Their families are literally out looking for them themselves. There's no database. There's no record of what happened. When I was at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum, they brought this issue before all the candidates. Elizabeth Warren was there, Bernie Sanders was there. And they asked these candidates what they would do about this crisis in Indian country and when they learned about it they all responded and said we will write a new law we will create new policies to protect this vulnerable demographic and when they asked me I said when your Declaration of Independence refers to natives as savages and your Constitution never mentions women don't act surprised when your indigenous women go missing and get murdered and society doesn't give a crap. A new law isn't going to fix this problem. And so I'm traveling the country, advocating at the top of my lungs, inviting people to join me in this quest that I'm on to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. Mark Charles asks, do you want to live in a nation where we the people means all the people? We are a diverse people where change can happen. From the lands of the Kalama, the Cowlitz, and the Clackamas people, we want to thank Mark Charles for his message, for his time, and for his commitment to change. Thank you for joining us on Brethren Voices. This is Brent Carlson wishing peace for all the people.